Okefenokee Swamp, once thought to be a land of darkness and mystery, is the home of a broad diversity of plants and animals. Although wilderness seems to be disappearing from the North American continent, the Okefenokee is preserved in a natural state as a national wildlife refuge by the United States Department of Interior. Most of the present refuge lands, which total over 395,000 acres, were purchased from the Hebert Lumber Company in 1936 for $1.50 an acre. A year later, President Franklin Roosevelt signed an executive order creating the refuge. I'm John Schroer, refuge manager of the Okefenokee National Wildlife Refuge. The Okefenokee National Wildlife Refuge was established in 1937. The primary objective of the refuge at that time was to preserve the unique natural qualities of the Okefenokee Swamp. Uh, since that time, the objectives have been expanded somewhat, the major one still being to preserve the swamp. In addition to that, uh, we are trying to manage for a diversity of the natural wildlife that lives in this area with particular emphasis on the endangered species, some of which include the American alligator, the wood stork, and the red cockaded woodpecker. Uh, every now and then we also get the American bald eagle come through the swamp. The Okefenokee National Wildlife Refuge is a respectable 395,000 acres. Uh, this makes it the largest refuge east of the Mississippi River. We host over 300,000 visitors a year. The Okefenokee National Wildlife Refuge is not alone. There are over 400 National Wildlife Refuges scattered throughout the United States. Uh, these refuges are administered by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which is in the Department of the Interior. Okefenokee National Wildlife Refuge is located in southeast Georgia, just north of the Florida border. The federally owned refuge lands include about 85% of the larger geological structure known as Okefenokee Swamp. Geologists who've studied the sand bottom basin on which the Okefenokee developed say that it was probably formed by the recession of an ancient Pleistocene sea. About 200,000 years ago, the earth was generally much warmer than it is today. There was little ice in the north polar region and sea level was much higher. Along the Atlantic coast, there was a long barrier island now called Trail Ridge, behind which was the Okefenokee Sound. As the glacial advances continued, sea level dropped, but Trail Ridge blocked the eastward flow of water from Okefenokee toward the sea. This isolated arm of the ancient Atlantic gradually transformed to a fresh water basin by rainfall and drainage to become the enchanted wilderness known as Okefenokee Swamp. The swamp is part of a larger hydrologic system known as the Okefenokee Watershed. It includes the swamp itself, the uplands to the northwest from which water drains into the swamp, and Trail Ridge to the east. The entire system is called a perched water system because it is underlain by impermeable rock, and the only water entering the system is rain. Okefenokee water has a brown color imparted to it by decaying vegetation. The dissolved organic substances, called humic and fulvic acids, are not toxic and are a normal part of any aquatic ecosystem which supports a thriving plant community. An interesting result of the rainwater softness of Okefenokee water and the detergent-like properties of humic and fulvic acids is that foam is often observed at waterfalls. This is a natural phenomenon and should not be mistaken for the presence of pollution. At certain angles, water in the swamp appears so dark that it looks black. Rivers, lakes, and swamps with dark water like that in Okefenokee are sometimes referred to as black water aquatic systems. Dr. Felicia West. The term swamp probably creates an image for you of an area in which the water is stagnant and standing. But this is not quite a true picture of the Okefenokee. The water moves through the swamp uh, due to very slow moving currents and is carried out of the swamp into the uh, rivers that drain the area. Uh, geologically, the swamp is uh, underlain by the uh, a northern extension of the, uh, the Florida aquifer, which is composed of the Ocala group of uh, permeable limestones. 
Alcala Limestone Group is in turn overlain by uh, impermeable sediments that are Miocene, Pliocene in age and uh, act as a confining uh, bed for the uh, surface waters above and the deep artesian waters below. The stream pattern draining off these slopes is trellis in nature. Uh, this is a series of parallel streams. The uh, stream patterns uh, that are there, uh, rather obscured but still there in the swamp, are dendritic in nature. Uh, this is uh, tree-like branches, uh, branching streams. This tends to substantiate the idea that this was never a freshwater lake, uh, that it was a, uh, probably the arm of an ancient uh, ocean that has since drained. Two uh, man-made structures that are fairly significant are the Swanee Canal and the uh, Sill. Now, the Swanee Canal was uh, resulted from the dreams of a Colonel Henry Jackson who had anticipated draining the swamp and using it for uh, agriculture, uh, developing it in that line. Uh, he started this project in about 1890 and dug uh, several miles of canal, uh, the remnants of which you can still see. Uh, unfortunately, in 1895, uh, two things happened. Uh, one, the swamp failed to cooperate and the water, instead of draining through the canal into the St. Mary's River Basin, which was the Colonel's intent, it drained uh, in reverse and drained into the Suwannee River Basin. And the colonel met an untimely death, and so the project ceased. The uh, sill was created back in the 50s uh, because the swamp is su uh, susceptible to uh, extreme damage by fires, both natural and man-made. This is an earthen dam with two spillways and those spillways allow the water to flow out of the uh, swamp uh, under the control of man. Peat core samples and weather records indicate that before the sill was built, severe droughts occurred within the Okefenokee at approximately 25-year intervals. Prolonged droughts occurred in 1844, 1860, 1910, 1932, and 1954 and 55. All of these droughts were followed by peat fires, some more severe than others. Most of the present lakes in the swamp originated in 1844. A prolonged drought was followed by severe fires that burned as much as one meter into the peat. The resulting depressions became the lake basins we now know by such picturesque names as Monkey Lake, Gannett Lake, and Little Cooter Lake. Peat fires burn the trees, shrubs, and even herbaceous vegetation, killing root systems and deepening the depression in the peat. Such catastrophic fires can only occur in a wetland system like the Okefenokee following prolonged, severe droughts. If periodic peat fires do not occur, the lakes and prairies that are a characteristic part of the mosaic of communities within the Okefenokee will be replaced by shrub or cypress swamps and open water areas will disappear. An understanding of the role of fire in the Okefenokee is vital to refuge management. The Okefenokee, as we know it, is fire dependent. Prairies are communities characterized by expanses of herbaceous or non-woody vegetation. When these communities were viewed from a distance by the early swamp settlers, the tall grasses and other herbaceous vegetation resembled the true prairies of the western United States and Canada. Okefenokee prairies are, in fact, freshwater marshes, flooded throughout most of the year, drying out only during severe drought. The most extensive prairies lie on the eastern side of the swamp. Grand Prairie and Chesser Prairie are two of the largest. There are about 60,000 acres of prairies within the swamp, or about 15% of the total area. Prairies represent shallow, peat-filled basins, frequently dotted with hammocks, containing shrubs and trees. The deeper water prairies are dominated by yellow water lilies and by never wets. The white water lily is seen more often on the western side of the swamp in the smaller prairie areas associated with the fingers of the Suwannee River. Wild iris bloom abundantly throughout the prairies in April. Many insects see blues and yellows more easily than reds, 
This is probably why so many wildflowers are colored shades of blue or yellow. This butterfly obtains nectar from the flowers. Pollen brushes off onto the antennae of the insect and is carried from flower to flower as the butterfly feeds. The thriving plant communities of the Okefenokee prairies are responsible for the formation of peat. Peat forms when layers of decaying vegetation accumulate for thousands of years on the swamp floor. Decay is slow and incomplete, and the decay process produces gas bubbles that may become trapped under the peat, lifting masses of peat to the surface. These peat masses that break loose from the bottom deposits and rise to the swamp surface are called batteries. Some batteries remain attached to the bottom and are like a huge bubble or bulge in the peat deposits with the edges still attached to the swamp floor. Other batteries break completely free from the bottom and float from place to place. Batteries may be less than a foot across or more than 50 feet across. Batteries rise and fall with the water level of the swamp and are rapidly colonized by seeds blown by wind or carried by birds. Sedges, grasses, and woody vegetation grow as the battery develops. Titi, buttonbush, and Virginia willow are commonly the first woody plants to appear on the battery. Finally, cypress and bays appear, and the battery has succeeded to a house. Houses, or tree islands, are large batteries on which trees have grown until their roots penetrate to the sand below. While the whole island may rise and fall with changing water levels, the tree roots anchor the island in place so that it cannot be blown about by the wind. Okefenokee traces its name to the Indian description for these floating communities, the land of the trembling earth. Both batteries and houses will move up and down as one walks across them, and if a person stands in one place, he may have the very real sensation of sinking as the water rises over his boots. Batteries and houses are used frequently as nesting sites for birds and alligators. Batteries are surrounded by the prairies, which provide some measure of protection during most of the nesting season from terrestrial predators, such as raccoons. The prairie community is home to one of the most unique birds of Okefenokee, the sandhill crane. Alan Bennett, a research biologist with the Georgia Cooperative Wildlife Research Unit, is studying the Okefenokee crane population, one of the largest in the southeast. visit a nest, uh, hopefully they'll land in view one of these times. You get to a nest just as it's hatching, they won't leave. Oh, really? Yeah, we've had uh, pairs just stand, you know, within 100 feet of us. When do they usually hatch out? Actually, about two-thirds to three-fourths of the nests are already hatched. Um, this is a re-nest here. The pair had lost their first nest. Uh, I think uh, predation in this instance. We get it. Raccoons are the biggie. Uh, they're the major predator. Uh, I think alligators uh, gobble up a few eggs, but it's a coincidence. You know, they go for anything white. Uh, marshmallows, golf balls. So <laughs> if an alligator climbs up on an area where there's a crane egg, he'll probably eat it. This is probably characteristic of about a third of the nest. The chicks right now, when this pair hatches this nest, they'll keep the chicks here for about 10 days, right on this battery, and they'll go out and see what they can catch out in the uh, water lily marsh around the nest site here and carry it up and feed it to the chicks. And uh, once they get about two weeks of age, then they'll lead them off of here, uh, probably to another dry site somewhere within 100 yards from here where the chicks can move around because they have to swim obviously if they're if they're out now anywhere and they're not able to move around too well uh, they're not like ducklings and uh, they do require a relatively dry site up until they're four or six weeks of age so that that's a pattern we've observed that they usually keep them at the nest sometimes they'll actually build platforms for the chicks if there isn't enough dry ground around this is something that uh, other crane populations don't do. They actually build brooding platforms, as we've called them, and move the chicks successively from one platform to the next 
until they reach an area where it's you know dry enough to support them. This is typical uh, uh, of an open prairie nest. Uh, a lot of the other pairs do nest in more closed situations where it's actually partially under the canopy of shrubs and cypress trees. The juveniles, after they leave the adults at one year of age, uh, move up to 15 miles, but do, do not leave the swamp. Uh, we've found, well, we've yet to have an instance of a crane leaving the swamp, going into Florida, or you know, use an upland site you know, off the edge of the swamp. They all pretty much stay in the swamp, but they do move around. During the summer, they're much more mobile because they're feeding on live prey and uh, use a much, much larger area. And in winter, uh, they're feeding on vegetable matter, and oftentimes they can just use a small number of floating type emergent habitats that, uh, you know, there's such a, a rich food source there that all they have to do is zero in on a few areas, and they don't move much during the winter. And of course, the water levels here in, in the swamp are cyclic, and when the water's low in the summer, the cranes can pretty well go where they please. Uh, during the winter, of course, uh, it's often 25 inches deep, and they won't go in water over 10 inches, so uh, the water level uh, influences their movements perhaps as much, if not more, than, than the, the food habits. Water levels in Okefenokee Swamp are influenced by a balance between three major factors. Rainfall, the amount of water drained by the Suwannee and St. Mary's rivers, and evapotranspiration. Evapotranspiration is a combination of evaporation and transpiration by plants. Because it is impossible to distinguish between these two processes in the field, they are measured together. Typically, water levels are lowest in December and June. December is at the end of a three-month dry season. June, however, is in the midst of the rainy season, which is May through September. Water levels drop in June because of evapotranspiration. 80% of rainfall is returned to the atmosphere by evapotranspiration, leaving only 20% to find its way down the Suwannee and St. Mary's rivers. Without dry periods and occasional fires, the prairies will eventually become forests. The eventual fate of Okefenokee vegetation is yet to be decided. Logging in the early 1900s may have shifted the balance permanently in favor of a shrub swamp climax. Dr. Carol DeMort. The Okefenokee is the largest freshwater swamp in the United States. It is dominated by woody vegetation. The primary forest association within the Okefenokee is a pond cypress forest, such as what we're going through. Pond cypress is one of these types of trees that deciduous, which means it loses all its leaves in the wintertime. This particular forest and most of the forest communities within the Okefenokee are second growth timber because all of the Okefenokee, or almost all the Okefenokee, was logged over in the early 1920s, between 1908 and 1927. There probably were a few small ones that weren't harvestable in those days that we're seeing probably the largest trees now are the ones that were seedlings or saplings in the early 1920s. This is not a climax forest, it is not a mature forest. These are young trees, probably 60 to 70 years old or in many cases much less than that. The understory trees are largely, other than pond cypress, there's a lot of black gum in here, there are a few small pond cypress. The herbaceous vegetation is, is the yellow water lily, or spatter dock, as some people call it. And this is a very, actually this is probably one of the better examples of second growth pond cypress within the, the park community. This that you see that's dead was the result of fires that occurred in the 1950s. Uh, in the 1950s, the water level dropped to the point where the actual peat was exposed, started drying out, and there were a series of very devastating fires in the early 1950s. And what you're seeing, a lot of these stumps, the very small stumps that you see, the stumps that actually the black gum are re regenerating from, were destroyed, were probably mature or sub-adult trees that were destroyed in the early 1950s. So we're looking at what we call sucker trees that are being regenerated from the growth of, of trees that were killed during those fires. 
The large cypress, which were cut in the early 1900s, were between 400 and 900 years old. Such old cypress tend not to send up new growth from the old stumps. Instead, the decaying stumps serve as sites for colonization of shrubs and bay trees. Germination of new trees in areas now dominated by pond cypress is made more difficult by high water levels maintained by the sill. For cypress seedlings to survive, they must germinate on exposed surfaces and must be able to grow fast enough to keep their tops above water. In contrast, the white water lily simply rises and falls with changing water levels. This unusual plant produces seeds which quickly sink to the bottom and become embedded in the peat. The seeds germinate well in acid conditions and often do best in water with little dissolved oxygen. The creatures of the swamp seem able to adjust to whatever fate befalls them. Loggers have come and gone and catastrophic fires used to sweep the swamp every 25 years. The most popular swamp creature sought out by human visitors is the American alligator. A true reptile, the gator often seems to be lurking in tall grass. It swims using a snake-like motion of its tail and body. Though regarded as fearsome, alligators are afraid of people and usually swim away or submerge. All alligators should be approached with caution and should be given a path of escape. A trapped gator has no choice but to fight its way to freedom. Alligators are secretive and try to remain as inconspicuous as possible in man's presence. Younger alligators tend to be more wary of the refuge visitor than the older generation who have often become desensitized to human presence. During the years since the wildlife refuge was established, legal hunting of alligators has stopped. Alligators are often seen sunning themselves along the banks of waterways. They are cold-blooded and use the sun's warmth to speed their metabolism. The sun also dries out their leathery skin, which helps to control parasites. Lulled by the sun, this sleeping alligator is at first unaware of our presence. Its throat muscles are used in breathing, the speed of which is proportional to its temperature. The alligators in Okefenokee are healthy and well-fed on a diet consisting mainly of fish and turtles. The eyes protrude from the top of the skull to allow a low profile in the water. Webbed feet with claws are used mainly for walking on land or underwater across the bottom of the swamp. Nostrils close automatically during a dive and are situated on the top of the snout to catch the first breath of air upon surfacing. Sometimes the only parts of a swimming alligator above water are eyes and nostrils. The alligator once shared this planet with dinosaurs. In fact, it has changed little in over 200 million years. It is still a reminder of the Mesozoic era, the age of reptiles. And in the Okefenokee, reptiles still rule this swamp wilderness. The alligator, like many reptiles, is primarily a nocturnal hunter and therefore most active at night. Areas like Billy's Lake and Minnie's Run are alive with alligators at night as they move silently through the lakes and waterways in search of prey. The eyes of many nocturnal hunters have a coating on the retina which enables them to see in dim light and which reflects light. In the mirror-like black waters of the Okefenokee, the alligator's eyes frequently appear to be doubled by reflections in the water. Nighttime in the Okefenokee is eerie and hauntingly beautiful. With morning light, another of the swamp's hunters begins to stir. Bears have adapted to swamp life in many ways. 
They have, for example, learned to deal with the biting insects found in the swamp. They use their sharp claws and their jaws to injure a pine tree so that the tree will exude a stream of pitch. The bear will cover himself with this pitch and roll in dirt and leaves, producing a covering which helps protect against biting flies. Black bears of the Okefenokee are the same species that roam the Rockies and the western states. Their color in the east is black, while it can range from black to cinnamon elsewhere. Their strength is sufficient to provide man with a dangerous adversary. Fortunately, they usually make every attempt to avoid man if possible. Occasionally, a lucky visitor to the swamp will see an osprey nest. Ospreys, sometimes called fish hawks, have characteristic light-colored feathers under the wings and on the chest. Notice that when it soars, the wings are held straight across, 180 degrees from each other. This is characteristic of all types of hawks and eagles. The yellow eyes are accented by a dark brown mask surrounded by light-colored feathers. The hooked beak is useful for tearing apart fish on which ospreys feed almost exclusively. Osprey nests were used as guideposts by early swampers. A mating pair of birds will keep others away from its section of prairie, and nests are typically about four miles apart. Swampers soon learned to recognize the different nest shapes and used them to find their way through monotonous prairie landscapes. Osprey catch fish with their feet, diving into the water feet first, sometimes below the surface. The most common sounds heard when an osprey is around are a repeated chirp or a longer call. Red-shouldered hawk is the most common hawk seen in the Okefenokee. They usually hunt alone, circling high overhead and diving steeply on potential prey, which includes insects, rodents, and small birds. Red-shouldered hawks will often hunt from a perch high in a cypress or pine. They may remain motionless, except for head movements, for long periods of time. Hawks are sight hunters, and have keener eyesight than man. Their eyes can detect the slightest movement, and their dive can exceed 50 miles per hour. Vultures are carrion eaters. They are scavengers and provide a valuable service within the swamp system. They can often be seen patrolling sections of the Okefenokee Swamp for the telltale scent of a carcass. Unlike hawks, vultures find food in the dense growth, mainly through a keen sense of smell. A much more common sight in Okefenokee is the prothonotary warbler. Look for it when you hear its characteristic song of ascending notes. Males are more brightly colored and the ones seen most often since they do the singing. They're conspicuously colored bright gold on the head, neck, and underparts and have gray wings. Prothonotary warblers are common in the swamp, but rare elsewhere. Bird watchers come from thousands of miles away for the opportunity of seeing and hearing these cheerful swamp inhabitants. They're present in all seasons except winter when they migrate along the Atlantic flyway southward to the jungles of Central and South America. The prothonotary nests within the swamp in the spring. It's the only eastern warbler to make its nest in tree cavities. Vacated woodpecker holes are its favorite nesting site. Most warblers are insectivorous, and this cheerful species is no exception. Its main diet consists of flies and ants, but it will also eat bees, caterpillars, and even water striders and small snails.
white-tailed deer are familiar to hunters and outdoor enthusiasts throughout the South. They're a common sight in Okefenokee. Deer are herbivorous, feeding on small trees and shrubs. They prefer young, woody growth to grasses or sedges. Deer are upland inhabitants and prefer the sand islands that dot the swamp. Deer are also easy targets for the numerous blood-sucking insects that thrive in the swamp. These insects include mosquitoes, deer flies, yellow flies, and horse flies like this one. Horse flies bite deeply, and the bite of such a large insect is painful. Deer respond instinctively by twitching their subcutaneous muscles. The twitching reflex fails to dislodge this fly, so the deer finally removes it with a quick lick. Otters are one of the less visible inhabitants of the swamp. They share the swamp's waters with alligators and maintain an uneasy existence. In summer, otters tend to restrict their activities and remain close to their dens. In winter, when alligators are slow moving and sluggish, otters venture out into the more open waters of the swamp. The affable and playful nature of otters helped man in his efforts to profit from the monetary value of their glossy pelts. Swampers showed great ingenuity in capturing these small animals, and they were well on their way to extinction. The creation of the wildlife refuge in 1937 stopped the slaughter, and otter are now recovering with the swamp population numbering in the hundreds. All swamp creatures except alligators must be wary of poisonous snakes. This eastern diamondback rattlesnake is at home along the swamp edge and in the palmetto scrub of the sand islands, like Billy's and Floyd's Island. This species is the largest of the rattlesnakes and it's belonged to the pit viper family. Pit vipers are poisonous snakes with vertically slit pupils and heat-sensing pits located between the nostrils and the eyes. They have retractable fangs, which can inject venom deep into the flesh of their prey. If you see one of these magnificent reptiles, walk around it and don't try to kill it. Over 80% of snake bite victims were harassing the snakes that bit them. Snakes are usually found on the ground, especially in a spot of sunlight. Contrary to folklore, snakes do not drop out of trees onto victims. Another poisonous snake occasionally seen in the swamp is the eastern coral snake. It has red bands bordered by narrow yellow bands and a black snout. These snakes are also seen on the sand islands. They burrow in the sand and leaf litter and hunt on the surface in the early morning and late afternoon. They're seen most often in the fall and spring. Coral snakes, unlike rattlers, must chew on their victims to inject their venom. Coral snake venom is more toxic than any of the American pit vipers, including rattlesnakes and cottonmouths. However, coral snakes are not aggressive and are not likely to bite unless handled or stepped on. The scarlet king snake is a harmless look-alike to the eastern coral snake. The two species differ in color pattern and, to some extent, in feeding habits. Their territory overlaps, and both feed on small lizards and other snakes. Both snakes have red, yellow, and black bands. The scarlet king snake, seen here, has the red bands bordered by black and a red nose. These non-poisonous snakes are primarily nocturnal and are rare throughout their range. It is also an inhabitant of the sand islands within the swamp. The green anole is probably the most common lizard in the south. It is abundant in the pine islands and swamp edges. Most reptiles shed the outer layer of skin in early spring or late winter as new growth begins. 
These lizards are no exception. Anoles change their color to blend with their surroundings. Their primary food consists of insects and spiders. Most conspicuous turtles within the Yokefinoki are the Florida cooters. They love to crawl out on stumps or logs and bask in the sun. If sunning spots are scarce, they may be seen stacked up on each other as the late arrivals climb on top of the early sunbathers. Newly hatched cooters feed on both plant and animal life, but after the first year, they're largely vegetarian. They have an ample supply of aquatic plants within the prairies and swamps of the Okefenokee. Their greatest natural enemy are alligators. Great egrets are commonly seen throughout the prairies and shallower cypress swamps. Closely related to herons, this large bird averages 32 inches tall with a wing spread of 54 inches. It nests within the swamp and can be seen throughout the year. It's the largest of the egrets and it walks along the shallows feeding on small fish, snails, mussels, and crayfish. The white ibis is closely related to both herons and egrets. It differs in having a slender, down-curving bill. The adult has a red face and bill with black wingtips, which are hidden when the bird is feeding. Adults may be 22 inches tall and have wing spreads of 38 to 40 inches. Ibis are wading birds with long necks, legs, and bills. They feed in shallow waters and marshes on small aquatic life like fish, insects, crustaceans, and snails. The Okefenokee Swamp and Wildlife Refuge is indeed an enchanted wilderness. Through the foresight of the U.S. Department of Interior, it will be preserved for future generations to seek communion with nature and to seek quiet solitude. For the creatures of Okefenokee, it is a haven where they may exist according to their natural ways and in harmony with man. There's something about wildness which eases the soul. Perhaps it is a visit to primitive beginnings. Perhaps it is a feeling of being one with nature. Whatever the reason, it is worth preserving.